In this module, we're going to discuss phonics as a component of reading development. Phonics is the second block of five that the National Reading Panel discusses as best practices for reading instruction. Now, as we've said before, remember that research and evidence-based practice is not one size fits all, so be sure to supplement these five blocks five pillars of reading instruction that we are discussing with evidence-based practice for the specific population and needs of your students. Because do note, the National Reading Panel did not focus on our students who are culturally and linguistically diverse. So what is phonics? Phonics is the relationship between a sound and its corresponding written letter. So we're in that first stage of phonemic awareness. We were talking about the auditory learning. We're now intentionally bringing in the written letter, the grapheme. Reading development is dependent on the understanding that letters and letter patterns represent sounds of spoken language. So our English language learners may pick up this code very quickly and appear to be fairly proficient readers as, as uh, you may find with some of your students, but it's important to, to be cautious because remember, knowledge of phonics and decoding is not the same as understanding, so it doesn't ensure good comprehension. So I, I want to just state that clearly here, but also hope that if you're curious about teaching comprehension that, that you look for that separate module, because here we're going to focus on phonics. So there's a lot of challenges that are very real that we need to be aware of for our students who are English language learners when we go through phonics instruction. So many of the vocabulary words that we're asking them to decode may be unfamiliar. One of the ways that students learn to read in their first language is by decoding the first few sounds and being able to predict the rest of the word because it's known to them. And so this is an added challenge for a student who's learning to read in a second language, especially when we can't assume that they've had any literacy instruction in L1. That's very common for, for our kindergarten and first graders who we are teaching to read because although they may have a wonderful, rich experience of spoken language um, in another language at home, they may not have, because they weren't school age, received any literacy instruction in L1. So, so we need to think of all of these variables as we prepare to teach. Now, it can be difficult for students to distinguish the phonetic components in new vocabulary words. And, and pre-teaching vocabulary is actually a crucial part of good phonics instruction. Now, in order to make sure the demands are not too great on our students, I recommend starting with vocabulary that is known. We don't want to make the task have so many demands simultaneously that our students don't feel successful. So when introducing a new skill such as decoding, try to start with those words that they do know, but certainly there's a great opportunity there to simultaneously be thoughtful and intentional about teaching vocabulary words that they will need for the current curriculum in their classroom. Students can become good word callers, but that does not necessarily mean they understand what they they're reading. So, so we mentioned this before, but I just want to reiterate how distinct these components are of, of phonics and decoding versus comprehension. So, you know, you could put uh, a French text in front of me and I might not sound, I won't sound native, but I could probably decode some of the words, but I won't be comprehending anything. So, so it's important to, to really think about, although we want to celebrate the strengths, that we can't take those strengths as an assumption that other skills are already there. Now, as we discussed, every student is unique and, and therefore we can't make assumptions about what literacy skills exist in the native language. However, when they do, what an opportunity for us to use those skills and transfer them to L2. 
the second language, and, and in many of these cases, that'll be English. Now, you only need to learn the concept of, of matching a symbol to a sound, phonics, once. So if you have that in your first language, whatever that may be, we can transfer that to whatever the second language is. So when I learned Spanish as a, as a sequential bilingual, so as a, a teenager when I started taking Spanish, it was so much easier for me to learn to read in Spanish than it was as a four and a five year old learning to read in English because I already understood what it meant to decode and, and that each letter represented a sound. And so I transferred that as I learned to read my second language. Um, so when that exists and you, you have students who, who come to you reading and literate in their first language, whew, what an opportunity if we take it. So it's really on us to use that wonderful knowledge and transfer it over to the second language. Now, when a student who is an English language learner has literacy skills in that native language, it's certainly a distinct advantage over those English language learners without those skills. So we need to also be focused not on when it's just easy to transfer, but those students who are learning a second language and learning to read for the first time. So what I would recommend both for our English language learners, but also our students who, who are just um, learning in their first language, to teach phonics in context. Use literature and content material to introduce and reinforce. Letter recognition, beginning and ending sounds, blends, silent letters, homonyms. Let's not just take these skills in isolation, but let's use wonderful children's literature, for example. Um, use names that the students know. Now certainly it's, it's too early to, to teach my son this, but since he has a, a silent E at the end of his name, I often, you know, every time I write it on his chalkboard, which he calls the right right board, I'm, I'm tempted to, to tell him, you know, that one's not gonna make a sound, but imagine how great it'll be when he is of that age and I can explain to him the concept of a silent E or a magic E as many of us educators refer to it because he knows that word so well. And so think about the kids in your classroom. Think about those that have a, a blend in their name like I do at the beginning and why not teach st Stephanie and the blend of ST with a word that, that the peers and, the, and your students have seen hanging on the wall of their classroom or on a stop sign instead of just taking this concept out of context. There's wonderful children's literature also for almost any of these skills uh, that you want to teach. So um, I, I highly recommend just enjoying the wonderful children's literature in your classroom. And as you do a read aloud, try to notice some of those things that could be additional teachable moments in addition to whatever you were initially presenting to your students, but that you could also highlight or even make it into a game and say, can anyone, you know, hear a blend in the word in the, the story that we just read. And if you hear a blend as I'm reading, tug on your ear or touch your nose and turn it into a fun search that they can participate in actively. I think it's so beneficial for our students and the research supports using hands-on activities to help teach the sound and letter relationships. So this can include using manipulatives such as counters, sound boxes, magnetic letters. There's wonderful ways to get our students engaged in touching the, the content of what they're learning. Now this has an added benefit. Beyond being engaging, when you give students a cookie sheet and magnetic letters, which you can get at the dollar store, so this doesn't have to be expensive. Beyond being engaging, how great that our students who perhaps have some fine motor needs, perhaps it's a student who receives occupational therapy, instead of having to write, they're able to master this sound symbol phonics by playing with the letters without having to have a task that could challenge them. So let's really isolate the tasks we're trying to teach and therefore allow our students to thrive. 
it's, it's what I like to think of as minimizing the impact of a disability and maximizing the opportunities to learn, in the words of Dr. Tom Hare. So as you introduce the grapheme to your students, building on the wonderful phonemic awareness that they gained as you taught them all those sounds, we now get to see the exciting journey of how they take that sound symbol understanding and relationship and put each of those relationships now into words and sentences and become readers.